Buenos días. Eh, la rama IEEE de la VG tiene el agrado de darles la bienvenida a la conferencia Vision Based Target Detection and Tracking Using UIBES, eh, que será impartida por el doctor Takuma Takamura, el máster Carlos Esquit, director del Departamento de Ingeniería Mecatrónica y Electrónica de esta casa de estudios, tiene el agrado de presentar la hoja de vida del doctor Takamura. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos a todos. Voy a hablar en inglés para que el presentador pueda pues, comprender lo que estamos diciendo, ¿verdad? Uh, welcome everybody. This afternoon we are we are going to have the pleasure to have a very nice presentation regarding autonomous vehicles. Um, first of all, I want to thank Giovanni Castillo, who established the contact. Uh, Giovanni, please, if you can stand up. He is a graduate in the civil engineering program here at UVG, and he just finished, he was telling me just a few days ago, his master's in Georgia Tech, specifically in the area of structural engineering. So he was a roommate with uh, Nakamura, and uh, he established the contact, and he was very kind to come here for vacation for one week, and offered to give this uh, interesting presentation to all of us. So Takuma Nakamura, he got a BS in aerospace engineering in Tohoku University, Japan in March 2013. And currently he is a PhD student in the aerospace engineering program at Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, we all know it's a highly ranked university Um, he has uh, some experience working with some projects and uh, participating in some competitions. For example, he attended the International Aerial Robotics Competition in Atlanta, USA, 2013. Uh, he worked in the project of teleoperated mobile robots, volcanic ash observation in um, 2011 to 2013. Also in the Human Powered Aircraft Project from the Aviation Club Wind Notes in Japan from 2009 to 2011. He has some awards and several international publications. So welcome and uh, we can get started. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you for introduction, and thank you, my friend Giovanni, who organized basically most of the stuff in my trip. Yeah, so let's let me start by the introduction. So a little bit about this presentation. So I will go over my background and also like the general stuff. My what my research laboratory is doing. So. Our laboratory is called a UAV RF, UAV research facility. So I will go over most of the stuff, not just about my specific research. And I will talk about like the motivation of this specific project, the vision-based target detection and tracking. And I will explain the theories and the equations about this specific project, like a, the machine learning-based uh, target detection algorithm called the high-light classifier and how this stuff is combined with the UAV stuff, like the how we are using the state of the vehicle, and also like the how we are using the Kalman filter for the improving the detection quality. And I'm going to share some experiment result and simulation result. And also we, the JITER, the Georgia Tech, the area robotics group, participating in the competition just last week, and uh, I'm going to share that result too, and ending up with the conclusion in the future work. Uh, uh, yeah. So let me talk a little bit about myself. Uh, yeah, as the professor introduced me, I've got, I'm a Japanese, and I've got my bachelor's degree back in 2013 in Japan in aerospace engineering. And I just finished the master's degree at Georgia Tech, and hopefully get my PhD in three years, but it's a PhD, so I don't know, probably three years, but nobody knows like the way exactly I am finishing up my PhD. I've been a graduate research assistant for two years with Dr. Johnson at Georgia Tech in aerospace. And I've got my private license, uh, private pilot license uh, when I was 
22 years old, so that was three years ago. And my, my private life and my career are highly involved in the aircraft. So I am a pilot, so I pilot a Cessna, the Warrior, like a small single engine, the, the proper aircraft. And I'm also an RC, the radio controlled helicopter pilot. And I piloted a human powered airplane, which is probably the most cool airplane, which many of you are not familiar with. So I have brought a cool video from my previous project. Sorry about the language, it's everything, everything is in Japanese. So I did this project when I was in Japan. This is a human powered aircraft. So it's very light and powered by the human. And I am actually cycling the pedals inside of this airplane. This airplane is made of the carbon fiber, so the CFRP. And most of the structure is made of the styloforms. It only weighs 30 kilograms. And so that is just a half weight of my weight. So the center of gravity is basically just my center of gravity of the body. And aspect ratio is about 40, and the wingspan was 37 meters. And this competition is called the Human Powered Aircraft uh, the Rally. It's international, so every year about 30 teams are coming to this competition and flying their Human Powered Aircraft over the lake. And yeah, what, well, the prop diameter is about two meters. And our aircraft successfully flew over 30 kilometers over the lake. And we won the, the first prize in this competition. That was in 2011, July. So this was probably the most biggest focus of my undergrad project. I spent three years to build this airplane and train very well to be able to pilot this aircraft. And this, yeah, thankfully this competition pulled a lot of the attention from many people. And that was probably one of the reasons why I got, I was admitted to the PhD program of the Georgia Tech Institute of Technology. Yeah, I think you barely saw me. Yeah, that was that was me, like four years ago. <laughs> I was piloting the airplane until I am completely exhausted. So like the, when I was the, the finishing up the competition like that, I couldn't even move like a, like the thirty feet or something. So like the, that was very exhaustive competition. So this is about me, and let me talk a little bit about our research laboratory, UAVRF. So our research laboratory is doing whatever related to UAVs. That involves in the many category of the aircraft. We do the research about the fixed wing, the helicopter, the gliders, etc., or ducted fan, small aircraft, and also the the research topics is also diverse and so we mainly do the research about the control system in aerospace related topics, the optimal control, the robust control, and the adaptive control using a neural network, and also the air-to-air -air chase, the vision-based navigation the target tracking and detection, also like uh, the acrobatic flight and the sling loading, like the carrying a heavy stuff and how that affects to the dynamics of the helicopters. We do the indoor flight, the outdoor flight, and the indoor flight it is mainly involved in the quadcopters, which is becoming really popular recently. So, and my research is also highly involved in the quadcopter stuff. So the drones, the UAVs are getting really popular recently and have become a very active research area for this five years or so. There is, that has several reasons, but the, it is said that the two main reasons is that battery become very lighter and stronger. So our UAVs are using 
the mainly the lipo batteries that can endure more than 10 minutes just with like 200 grams of the batteries. Also, the sensors have been involved, uh, improved very, very, very well. So now it can output in a better order, in, in a in a different magnitude of the order. So. Due to several things, the UAVs has become very popular, and my research laboratories is doing the research about UAVs for more than 10 years. And this video is basically the summary of our 10-year work. So what else? So this is our simulation. So one of the reasons why our research laboratory can do various work related to UAVs is this simulation software. The same simulation is, uh, the same software is actually working in the hardware as well as the simulation computer. So the UAVs can exactly do the same thing as they did in the simulation. So most of the people test their algorithm and the software in the, in the simulation. After that, they try to code in the hardware. But actually, we skip that part. So whenever you test in the simulation, it happens in reality. So this way, we can do the, re the research very quickly about the various steps. Uh, I think this video is about to, about to finish. Uh, so our research travel is mainly using the two types of the, the aircraft, which, uh, one of which is uh, the Japanese Yamaha Armax, which weighs more than more than 100 kilograms and it can endure more than two hours. That is basically designed in Japan to spray the agricultural chemical to the rice field since Japan is very crowded and the residential area very close to the rice house, uh, rice field. People really uh, didn't fly the manned helicopter to spray the agricultural chemical from the high altitude. So we are using the various types of the helicopters, but the Armax is the one we are mainly using in recent research. Okay, so this is kind of an introduction of myself and my research laboratory. So I'll talk about more vision stuff, which is my own research topic. So the computer vision is, has, has been an active research area for many years, but it is recently becoming very popular for several reasons. So one reason is that like the camera has been got a lot better. And also like the, there is a the open source library called OpenCV, which was kind of developed when we did DARPA Avant Challenge, the autonomous car, autonomous car competition. So during that competition, like many universities had the, the autonomous car for that competition and developed a autonomous algorithm very well. And the one you can see on the right is our, the Georgia Tech team, the autonomous car. We also participated in that Dapper Avant Challenge. Uh, we didn't win, but we also did a kind of a good job and the people are still the, working on the uh, autonomous car project. And there are several other things applied uh, for like uh, robotics and even the, the robot, the Curiosity, which is actually operating right now on the Mars is using the computer vision. And I am also interested in the computer vision since I was like high school student or probably the junior year of the college student and wanted to do some work related to the computer vision. So I just talked to my boss and I, I want to do some work related to the UAVs and the computer vision and my professor accept that idea and I'm doing research about computer vision and the UAVs for two years for now. And specifically, the target detection tracking the project is coming from this motivation. So our GTAR team participated in the HS Student Challenge, the mission of which is to find the red circle. You can see the red circle on the bottom image of the left. The mission is to find that red circle 
which is put at unknown location. So our UAVs take off from the helipad autonomously and find the, that red circle and try to hover over that target and coming back to the initial takeoff place autonomously. So everything has to be autonomously plus indoor. So we couldn't use a GPS. With GPS, this level of the mission should be easier, but if you want to accomplish this mission indoor, there are several things uh, we need to work on. And one of that was to find the target and the helipad using the vision system. So my specific interest was how to find and track the target and the helipad using the vision system. I decided to use this algorithm called the hard classifier. This was successful in like the many categories of the objecting, uh, so sorry, detecting the object. This is a machine learning based algorithm. I prepared thousands of images that has the target in the image and also prepared like 10,000 of images that doesn't have the image. So by using these images, you can train the object file about like how does the object look like and how does the no object look like. This algorithm is very flexible and you can easily train your own target, but it takes a lot of time to train the object file. Uh, and this is also one of the functions implemented in the OpenCV, and you can use a C, C++, and the Python. So this is open for many kind of stuff, and initially that was developed in the Stanford University for the DAPA Urban Challenge, but currently everybody can use this algorithm. So I'll talk a little bit more about this algorithm. So for example, uh, so the method how to train the object file is as follows. So we prepare lots of the templates that look like the top image on the slide. So if your target has a more darker look uh, in the, in the grayscale, the first example on the top left shows true. And so I'll try to show some example. So Let's say this flag, this flag has some patterns. So this left part is darker and this right part is darker and this middle is whiter. So in that case, uh, let's say, I don't have a good, oh uh, yeah, right. So the third template from the left, that shows false because it is opposite. The middle part is more like whiter and on the edge is darker. So that template shows re uh, returns a false, but the, if we have the another, the opposite patterns of the template, that returns a truth. So we do the same operation with all the templates and uh, do the same thing for thousands of images. So this way we can train how the target look like. And this algorithm is very flexible and kind of robust enough for the inclination. This is very useful for our purpose because we have the onboard camera fixed to the quadcopter facing downward. So if our quadcopter sees a target on the edge of the image, that is kind of inclined like 30 degrees to 40 degrees because our camera's field of view is about 80 degrees. So yeah, this algorithm is very flexible and robust enough to find a target, but it takes a lot of time and you need to prepare a lot of the pictures. So one very common usage of this algorithm is face detection. This, this is me and uh, I'm wearing a t-shirt with uh, some famous guitarist, which I don't know, but yeah. you know who is this? Uh, I, th I think that should be a famous guitarist, but this is used for the face detection. <laughs> Nobody knows who it is? Okay. Whatever, okay. So you probably have some smartphone or like SLR cameras that has face detection. So it, I'm using the same algorithm that your cameras is using. So you, how your camera can detect a person is as follows. You prepare like the 10,000 or million of people's 
actually says 30,000 of the people's face and trained how people's face look like. And I do the same thing with my helipad and the target the red circle image. So it is machine learning based algorithm and like just prepare like lots of people's face and probably the monkey's face not to detect that monkey as a human face. So this is kind of a basic strategy of the pattern recognition based machine learning algorithm. So, but still, if you just spend two weeks with like the thousands of the images, that measurement is very noisy. So we decide to use the kind of combination of the hard light classifier algorithm plus the vehicle state. Since the, it's robot, like the flying quadcopter, and it has a sensors like called IMU, which is a accelerometer and gyroscope. And also it has a barometric pressure sensor and the sonars. And if that has a GPS, it can also use the position as the state of the vehicle. If I combine these states of a vehicle to the how I classifier, the measurement should be more like clear and less noisier. So the first, the, the adjustment for the how I classifier is using the pixel size since we know how big the target is, and also we know how high the quadcopter is flying. We should be able to calculate how big the target should look like in the pixel. So this is just a simple algebra. So W and H is the resolution of the camera, and A and B is the dimension of the target in reality. So it is in the unit of feet. And Z is altitude, and gamma X and gamma Y is a field of view in the horizontal and the vertical direction. So this way we can calculate like how big the target should look like in our onboard camera, which is A and B. I'm using that A and B to kind of constrain the searching pixel size. So the, the K is, uh, what's that? and the correction factors, which is the function of Z and P. So in PZ is the, the estimated error covariance matrix from the navigation solution. So that is kind of separated from my algorithm, but as you fly the quadcopter, we need to estimate the state of the vehicle, which is done by using the, our vehicle's sensors, the IMU, the sonars, the their barometric pressures and the magnetometers. So we are using the extended Kalman filter to get the navigation solution. And the PZ is an estimated error covariance matrix for the altitude. So if that is bigger, we have more uncertainty about altitude estimation. And also I use the altitude itself for the fun, uh, kind of argument for the function K. That is because if you are flying higher, more distance is squeezed into the same resolution. So that increased the uncertainty because the camera resolution uh, remains the same as uh, even if you're flying higher. So this way we kind of decide like the, where is the searching pixel size and which should be kind of a close to the actual the target size. So this is kind of the result of that filter stuff. So the left shows the low measurement of the hard classifier, which looks very noisy. So like the diagonal crossings are trying to search the red circle and horizontal and the vertical crossing are trying to search the helipad. As you can see, the left one shows very big and very small crossings. That is because it doesn't know the size of the target in the helipad. But right one knows how big the target in the helipad should look like. And only searching the pixel that is closer to the calculated, uh, the estimated pixel size using the previous equations. So that already filters out most of the wrong hit, but still it shows it shows wrong positive hit. So unless we are deciding that this is the one which is most likely to be the target, this algorithm is useless for the competition. 
So I decide to use one more step. I, I decide to take one more step for the competition, which is extended Kalman filter. As you probably know about the Kalman filter, extended Kalman filter is a Kalman filter linearized around the current, current estimation. So the x di equal a x plus d one w. So the d one w is basically the process noise, and d two w is basically the measurement noise. The trick here is probably the C matrix. Our x, which is a state, and the position of the target with respect to the camera, expressed in the inertia frame. This way, we can know, like, by combining with the, the state of the vehicle where the target is located in the inertial frame. But our output is a measurement in the camera. So all we know is like the where is the target located in our camera and which need to convert which need to be converted to the the state of the uh, the position of the target expressed in the inertial frame. So I will talk about a little a little, bit, a little bit about that C matrix, but this is kind of basic setup. So the A matrix, the state matrix, is just a zero, the bunch of zeros, because the target is fixed to the ground, and which we already know it's fixed to the ground. And the D is a U and V in the camera frame in resolution, uh, in the pixels. So the trick here, it's this C matrix. This is kind of derived in my lab, the previous lab mates, and he got a PhD basically with this derivation. So this mathematics is very important. So what we need to calculate is a partial Z, partial RI. The RI is a position vector expressed in the inertial frame. So, but Z is a pixel expressed in the camera frame, and position vector is expressed in an inertial frame. So we cannot directly calculate that the C matrix. So like he decided to use the RC, which is a position vector expressed in a camera frame as a middleman. So this way, we can separate that ugly C matrix into two parts. The left one is a, basically the camera specification, and the right one is basically the transformation matrix from inertial frame to camera frame. And that camera specification part can be calculated using the focal lens and also the resolution and the field of the view of the, uh, of the camera. And X, that, uh, the, since al we already know the altitude of the vehicle, we already can calculate like the kind of optimal direction, optimal directional uh, the distance to the target because the target is always fixed to the ground. So this part can be calculated by using the known information. So that is why we can have the left side of the C matrix already. And right side of the C matrix, very simple, just using the standard 3 to 1 sequence Euler angle, and it can get the transformation matrix from the inertial frame to body. And also, the camera is fixed to the vehicle, which is facing down. So the rotation from body frame to camera frame is simply the 19 degree rotation around vehicle's y axis. So this is how we get the LIC, which is the transformation matrix from inertial frame to camera frame. And the rest of the things is very straightforward, just our standard, the discrete system Kalman filter. The one thing you notice is just the A matrix disappears since the target is not moving. So in continuous system, A matrix is just a zero, 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 zero. And in a discrete system, that becomes exponential A time step. That becomes, say, the one, zero, zero, one, so which is identity matrix. So the A matrix basically disappears, and the propagation is just adding up the process noise to the current the expected error covariance matrix. And the measurement update comes, which is a target location you can calculate the, the posterior expected error covariance matrix, which is 
he helped. So this is it for the mathematics. So we did the flight test in the Vicon room. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with the Vicon room. Vicon room is a kind of, Vicon is a 3D position and attitude tracking system. We use a room which has like 20 to 30 highly calibrated cameras. And each of the camera measures the distance to this the silver ball, which we call the bicon ball. So it's reflecting the infrared, and the, the, each of the camera can measure the distance to that reflecting the bicon ball. I put these balls to the vehicle as well as the target and the helipad. So in the actual competition environment, we cannot use a bicon room, so which is external aid. But for the research purpose. It is always good to know like, what is the right target position and what is the right the vehicle state. So we use the, uh, the Vicon room for the flight test. And this is the kind of the one of the final result. So using the extended Kalman filter and also using the vehicle state to eliminate the wrong pixel size. And that circle, oh, sorry, the rectangle is trying to search the red circle. And the circle is trying to search the helipad. And as you can see, like a, this is kind of worst case. We made the camera exposure to a really, really bad one. So like the, basically the target is now white rectangle and the helipad is very, very whited out. So even if, like the measurement gets really noisier. The, by combining the hot classifier with my, my technique, like it can successfully find the helipad in the target location. And here's the plots of that. As you can see, it's tracking it very well. The green crossing is a raw measurement, which is very noisy. And the red line is a true position, which is coming from the Vicon system. And that blow, uh, sorry, the black plotting is kind of estimated point. So that black line is very uh, accurately tracking the red line, which means that my target tracking system is finding the actual target, uh, target position very well. And here's another result for the helipad, which is also working very well. And this is another stuff. I decide to use a multiple extended Kalman filter. So this, the purpose of which is very various. So when we have multiple helipad or multiple target, like this, if we use a multiple extended Kalman filter, it can find both of that. And also that reduces the risk of like one extended Kalman filter is ending up with like the finding a wrong target. So I want to make sure at least one of the extended Kalman filter is tracking the right, right target. As you can see, so the rectangle is still trying to search the red circle and circle the, is trying to search the helipad. And two extended Kalman filter successfully found the red circle and one helipad found the, the actual helipad, but the second extended Kalman filter didn't track anything, which is good because it means it, it can't distinguish what the actual helipad look like and what does the kind of fake these, the patterns is actually, should, should look different from the helipad and my algorithm distinguished actual helipad and these fake patterns. And the final one is the simulation result. The simulation is always good because we can test our algorithm without the, having the risk of losing our vehicle or hurting anybody. But, <laughs> but still, like, if you think about like, the research about computer vision, the simulation is a really good environment to test. Like, you guys probably have experience with video games, but video games is always look different from the reality. So if you 
like uh, train the hard classifier object file and run the simulation with that algorithm, like simulation should return always a kind of better result. But in this in, uh, in this simulation with my algorithm, the simulation and the reality almost returns the the same result. So which is which is good and a kind of proof of the robustness of my target finding finding algorithm. So this is it for for this research talk and the conclusion is as follows. Uh, my algorithm can find the, the target and the helipart, but kind of distinguishing the two images are hurt, but which is probably okay as long as a target the two multiple targets and the helipart are separated enough. So if we have a priori information, like the, where roughly the target in the helipart is located, we can use that information to separate, okay, this is not the target, this should be the helipart because that is too far from the a priori information. And even if there are multiple targets in tracker, uh, the targets, the tracker, find them very well, and the simulation result uh, can be used to predict the mission success without actually having the flight test. And most importantly, we won the HS student challenge, so I'm going to share that result, which is very cool. Uh, just uh, the re-explaining the mission. So the mission is to take off from the helipad, which is known information. And trying to find the red circle, which is put at unknown location, and which is indoor flight mission, so we can use GPS or any other external aid. So it is using the inertial navigation to find the target, so which is basically just a random search. And after finding a target, it tried to hover over the red circle, which is kind of hard to see, but like the, now it's hovering over the target. You can probably see some circle on the floor. And 30 seconds hovering is required. And after that, it's trying to coming back to the initial helipad location just using the the navigate uh, the inertial inertial navigation yeah if you, you want to more about that inertial navigation which is actually not just the inertial navigation also using the vision system trying to find the feature point and tracking that feature point so like the, it is vision aided inertial navigation system which is uh, my my friend's PhD thesis. So it, my algorithm is combined with the vision and natural navigation system, and it's working very well. And this is the kind of biggest part. And it's trying to land on the helipad autonomously, and that's the end of the mission. All right, so, and we won the competition. All right, so the future work, a little bit about future work. So I'm trying to pursue a PhD with kind of vision-aided the navigation system. And next step is probably to try to land or approach to the mobile target. So we found the best competition, which is called IARC, International Area Robotics Challenge. So this competition is, uh, the mission of this competition is to herd at least seven of the ground robots, which is running randomly around the, around the field. And uh, there, are also, uh, there are also 10 obstacle robots, which we need to avoid using some laser range sensor or another collision avoidance system. And in order to achieve this competition, we definitely need to find a mobile target and need to find a way to approach to a mobile mobile target. So I already simulated a using my target tracker. Currently I put the target image on the ground vehicle, but eventually I need to train a new object file to find this ground robot. So the approach is very simple. So it's still extended Kalman filter, but A matrix is looks should look different because it's already not the static target, it's mobile target. So, but still the target dynamics should be known and uh, we can 
create another A matrix, which the correctly represent the dynamics of the ground robot. So this is, yeah, my future work, and uh, hopefully in the next competition we can win the competition using my target tracker. So I think this is it for the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for listening, and uh, this is it. Hello. Uh, when you showed the tracking, the, the position of the actual data, there was a part where you saw a, a little dev deviation from the from the uh, where it's supposed to be for, from the actual place. Do you know why this happened? Yes. So I know what you're. I, I'm actually like the which exactly on the slide, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. So if there were no consistent measurement, it trying to find the consistent measurement, which was unfortunately the target. So we are trying to search the helipad, but if there is no measurement, the consistent measurement about, about the target, like it shifted to the helipad. So as I explained in the conclusion part, distinguishing the heliport and the target was very hard because both of them are same size and just a circle. So sometimes the hard classifier misunderstood that, hey, this is a, this is a heliport, but that was actually the tar target red circle. So that was kind of a one thing I need, I probably need to work on, but so far we didn't see the mission where target and heliport are located very closely. So as long as they're separated enough, we can use that information to distinguish, okay, this, is, this should not be the target because this is far away from our a priori information. So yes, so if there is no consistent measurement, that happens. Okay, and have you considered using quaternions instead of Euler transformation matrix to calculate the camera state? Well, actually, yeah, I love you mentioned the quaternion. Yes, we are using quaternion. I just uh, use the Euler angle to pre uh, the, for the presentation. But yes, uh, yeah, vehicle states using the quaternion, every calculation done by calcu uh, the quaternion. Just the result is showing the Euler angle, which is converted from the quaternion. So yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hi, um, very nice presentation. And I wanted to ask you, how do you bound the, the space area in which you were searching, searching for, the, for the target and the helipad? And also, if you were performing any kind of like simultaneous localization and mapping to maybe to avoid any obstacles or something like that? Uh, well, I, I will first answer the second part. No, I'm not working on the collision avoidance part. So there are seven, eight, 10 PhD students are in my laboratory and one of them are really specifying the collision avoidance. So we made a group who's working on, hey, I'm in charge of the vision, I'm in charge of the collision avoidance, et cetera. So uh, yeah, I'm not really an expert of the collision avoidance system. And the first question was how to bound the target. So I didn't put that in the, in the slide, but like we are doing some stati statistical test, which is called a Z-test. So since the expected error covariance matrix already shows like how unlikely or how uncertain our current estimation is. So if the measurement is far away from our current estimated, the best estimation, which still has some possibility to be the right target. In order to decide, okay, should we take this measurement 
as a new update, or should we just ignore that measurement because that is too far? We use the Mahala novice distance norm, Mahala novice norm, which is basically kind of a the determinant of the 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 CPC transports plus the measurement noise. So, which is can be calculated during we are doing the extended Kalman filter. I think that probably showing the equation is easier to explain. Uh, which was the equation? So here, so C P tilde K C transports plus R inverse. That one shows like the how on how uncertain our current extended Kalman filter is. So if that value is big, we take the far away measurement, which is like a really far from our current estimate. If that value is small, we are kind of certain, okay, we, our extended Kalman filter should be working very well at this point. Then we ignore that, that measurement. So this, this is how we bound like the, where should be the measurement Measurements should be located. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Takuma, for this amazing uh, exposition. I think you have uh, enlightened us for just having a, another vision of what is uh, going on around the world and also how we can push our boundaries for studying harder and uh, seeking for research in our own media as well. So my, I just, want, I just have a comment and then a question. Uh, Takuma was my roommate for two years at Georgia Tech while I was pursuing my, my master's there. And we had some interesting conversations. I, as you can see, some, some days were really tough. He's a very hard working person and very dedicated. It was an example for me to push my boundaries he was coming very late at night working. So I just wanted to mention that because behind this, that looks very like um, sophisticated and very uh, uh, probably state of the art uh, research. There's a lot of hard work and uh, we need to push that boundary for our own, uh, uh, I don't know, sake and uh, become better. But my question probably is, now that you've done this research, what do you think it would be the next step for, for you? And also what's up there in the media? Like I know about the Amazon Prime that you mentioned the other day, that is like a tracking UAV, which is gonna take some packaging and deliver them. Some systems are already using that, but you can, you can tell more about it. I don't know about this area, so thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'm not done with research, so like uh, I still have to do research for three more years at least. But yeah, in general, yeah, there are a bunch of the like, infinitely many more applications about UAVs. What I'm doing is just uh, one of them. So as Giovanni the mentioned, the Prime Air, so the Amazon is currently trying to deliver your package using the UAVs. So Without rules and regulation, there is still a lot of the, the research required. So probably we need to make our like the post that should look different from what we currently have and allow the, our quadcopters or another vehicle to land on the post and uh, put the package on the, on the specific place. And, uh, for which probably they can use my vision system. And yeah, and the delivering stuff is very hard. So like the, that changed the dynamics and immediately after they drop the package, like the, the state matrix, the A matrix changed dr drastically. So like the, we have to do the research about like a kind of a hybrid control system where something immediately changes. The controlling the vehicle is very hard. So yeah, there, bunch of the active research area about the uh, UAVs. Well, what about drones or military service? What, would this be applicable to that? Uh, I'm sorry? To military 
units? Yes, uh, yes, military. So currently, the Global Hawk and the Predator are already in the operation, and uh, more than hundreds of the Predator and the Global Hawks are in are flying in the Afghanistan and Iraq and the many other countries. So yes, it's already in the operation. And the military are very interested in the UAVs. So, and our one of the huge sponsors actually, the military. So, and, and one last before the other question. Uh, you mentioned that, the, that you have a, in your laboratory a very big UAV. How large is that? And what would be the next step for that? Uh, the RMAX, RMAX is about 80 kilograms and uh, the diameter of the rotor is about two meters, three meters, and the fuselage is more than the 10 meter in length. So yeah, that's a huge, huge UAV. And the next step is probably doing the similar things as we are doing with quadcopters. So if that size of a drone can autonomously find the heliport and take off from the from some place and find the find the target which we are looking for. It can be used for various stuff like a rescue operation, like a volcano observation, or I don't know, like the first response for like the 911, etc. So yeah, there there are various various usage for, for that. Uh, when uh, you were um, you program all this and simulate it, but how did you migrate to the quadcopter and more specifically, what um, uh, processor are you using? Okay, the processor is the i7, so probably the same computer you're using in a computer. And uh, there is a kind of onboard, like the, the PC board, and we are using kind of game PC board called uh, the Gigabyte Bricks, which is very strong and probably stronger than your desktop computer. So, <laughs> yeah, actually, the, it's it's sad, but like the, our quadcopter is very fast. So like the sometimes what well, we simulate it doesn't work in computer, but it works in reality. That is because our onboard computer is very strong. So uh, did I answer all of the, your questions? Okay. Um, I realized in, uh, in your presentation, I don't know if it's just a coincidence or if you can give us a little more insight about that, but the error in the x-axis is always, according to your results, the opposite to the error in the y-axis. Uh, let's see. That may be true, like I found a small bug before presenting this stuff in conference. So yeah, I basically using the similar slides I use for my conference. And that may be true, that may not be true. Uh, which yeah, I'm just wondering if there is an explanation or if it's just a coincidence from the tests. You can see there the, the X error is negative at the very beginning and it is positive for the Y axis. Oh, okay, so yeah, in this case, it, it has nothing to do with my bug. That is simply because that, so this is trying to find a target, red circle, but it mistakenly took the helipad. So the reason why it happened is simply because helipad is located at this position. So if I move the helipad to a different position, it should like to move to the opposite direction. Okay, okay. I don't know if there's any, other, any additional question. No? Well, so I'm going to proceed with, uh, to give you a diploma that we have for you. And this 
César it follows. Universidad del Valle de Guatemala grants the present diploma to Takuma Nakamura in recognition to his collaboration with IEEE UVG through his presentation, vision-based target detection and tracking using UAVs, presented at our main UVG campus in Guatemala City. Guatemala, May 11, 2015. So thank you very much for your nice presentation. We are very thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, some gifts for you. We have, uh, there is a, well, maybe you can open it later. There is a UVG cup, so you can keep UVG in your mind. And there is a, a nice uh, backpack as well that I'm pretty sure you will use that at your own university. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. I think it is always very nice to see what people is doing all around the world. And as I said at the very beginning, uh, this is, we all know this is a top university worldwide. So it's very nice to see some matches with some of the projects that uh, our students are working here. And I think they're very excited. And I hope that you have a very nice time here in Guatemala during this week. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.